Welcome to Prog Rock Digital. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Prog Rock Digital. This is episode 5 of season 2. Thank you for downloading and streaming. Thank you for visiting progrockdigital.com. Keep those emails coming through. Greatly appreciated. We had some sad news of the passing of Bill Damas from the band Warlord. Condolences go out to Bill's family, friends, band members, as well as his partner in crime and co-founding member of Warlord, Mark Zonder. When the band Warlord was founded, both Mark and Bill were in their you know, late teens, early 20s. They lived together. They wrote songs together. They recorded together. Now, that camaraderie, that mutual respect, that whole love for the same band, that same vision, unfortunately, in this day and age, is lost, especially now during COVID, especially at the fact that we can record albums overnight we can send files from one side of the country to the other or from one side of the world to the other or where we have five or six different musical projects happen happening at once we in turn you know directly or, or indirectly take our focus off a common goal a common goal that was set in stone by friends and i think the key word here is relationships unfortunately we're moving into times where that is non-existent bands are going to be fabricated either by tv or radio all this thing that we call the internet times have changed and that love for one project that love for one band has has gone away no more are you playing in a band with friends no more are you high-fiving your mate because what you've just played has sounded great and because you're going out tonight and you're gonna have a beer together that's non-existent warlord as did so many bands back in the 80s they lived the dream together and I have a lot of a lot of respect for these bands. And by God, thank you very much. Thank you for releasing music from the heart because that's what it was. It was music from the soul at a certain point in time. I had Mark Zonder on the show back in 2020. And I'm going to play some snippets of that interview that interview was, if you like, in two parts. But the first part of that interview was centric to the early Warlord years. So you're going to get a, an in-depth look at what life was like through the eyes of Mark Zonder, obviously. But he clearly states some, some fascinating details. So... I hope you enjoy this. Once again, our condolences to the Tamas family, the Warlord family, and to his buddy, Mark Sonder. Paris of Troy, out through Ludos Records, their debut single, Torn Away. True Australian prog at its best. Available for download and stream on all digital platforms. Hello, this is Mick Box of Uriah Heap, and you're listening to Prog Rock Digital. The way Warlord started was I was playing in San Jose in a band called Russian Roulette, and it was a cover band, and we played the Scorpions, Thin Lizzy, um, UFO, uh, those kind of things, you know, Rainbow, uh, and 
the girlfriend of a lead singer uh, knew this guy worked at this bookstore named Bill Samus. And she brought him over to see the gig because she thought his style and my style would work really well together in an original band. We started talking and then we just started jamming and me and Bill spent hours just guitar and drums. Nobody else, no bass player, no singer. Hours and hours. A lot of those songs were written and or worked up with just Bill and I. You know, we sat there for hours and hours and just playing. And to answer your question, yes, absolutely. You have to remember Warlord was coming out, um, you know, 1983-ish. Okay, what do you got? You got Motley Crue, you got Rat, you got Poison, you've got, you know, Faster Pussycats. And that's great. You know, that's Hollywood Sunset. Unfortunately, we were still in, we were an L.A. band because we were in L.A., North Hollywood. But we weren't like that. So as much as we had fans that were in love with the band, it wasn't this mass appeal like when those other bands would hit. You know, let's face it, as soon as Motley Crue got signed and, and started to be successful, what did every record label in town want to do? Oh, we got to get a band just like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Warlord just never, it just, you know, and as much as I appreciate Brian Slagle and as much as he did, for Warlord, um, I'll, I'll tell you an inside story. Uh, Bill and I, after Deliverus was done, went to a gentleman's name. His name was Michael Browning. And he managed ACDC at the time. And we went up there because we, we, we were looking for management. He takes our record, sits us down, and he literally sits there for 33 minutes and listens to both sides. Stops the record and he looks at us and he goes, you guys have a platinum record right there. And me and Bill are like getting all excited. You know, we're going, oh, oh my God, here we go. You know, you know, where are the girls? Where's the champagne? Okay, here we go. And he, go, and he, looks, us, he looks us straight in the eye and I'll never forget this. And I really appreciated it. He says, but no one will hear this because Metal Blade's not going to do a damn thing with it. They don't know what to do with it. Mm. So you're, 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 nothing's going to happen. But I'll tell you, that is a platinum record, you know? And we, and we felt good, <laughs> you know, it was good. But yeah, it's um, the Warlord thing, it, the timing, and that's the whole reason we did the video. You know, you have to remember, this is way before iPhone cameras and way before, you know, $200 little video cameras that everybody has. We knew that we weren't an LA band. We knew that we needed to get out to Europe, but no one was gonna be flying us there. So we thought the easiest way, especially this was kind of that MTV uh, music video one or whatever it was. So we thought, hey, if we did a video, at least these people could see exactly what we're trying to do and what we're all about. But yeah, that was a that was kind of Warlord was always the could have, should have, would have band in my book that, you know, should have went. You know, I guess I played a couple of played in a couple of those kind of bands, but you know, there's uh that should have been big. I really think that band could have been really big. The man behind some of the most iconic pieces of art connected to some of the biggest names in rock, Ioannis. Originally from Athens, Greece, in the last 36 years has created over 300 record covers for such clients as King Crimson, Fate's Warning, Uriah Heep, Allman Brothers, Blue Oyster Cult, Leonard Skinner, Ingve Malmsteen, Deep Purple, Styx, just to name a few. Be sure to connect with Ioannis at www.dangerousage.com. We're back with Mark on the recording of the first album. Eight track studio, okay? Eight track reel to reel, where the engineer smoked crack cigarettes uh, or cocaine cigarettes for the duration of the whole thing. I'll never forget that smell though. That's one of those kind of smells that like wherever you, if I go someplace and I smell that, I go, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> but now picture this, you know, I'm playing this ridiculously oversized drum set, you know, 26 inch bass drums and the whole bit. That record, you know, back then, you know, there was nothing digital. So what they had to do, what the engineer did, and he was great. He was a really good engineer, uh, taking into account the situation that we were under, eight tracks. So he wound up taking the two bass drums and the bass guitar and putting that on one track. The drums were on two. So, okay, three are down. Then you got the vocal, 
and then you have guitars and keys and whatever, whatever. But yeah, that was eight hundred dollars. Those were the days of the big budgets, and uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was it was quite the experience, I have to say. There, there is no doubt, and anybody will tell you this, that Warlord is Bill and I, okay, and it's Bill and I for different reasons. The, the way this band really worked in the beginning was obviously I'm not writing music. Bill's writing all the music. Uh, another thing people need to know is Bill looks at the vocal as just another instrument. So he wrote all the lyrics. He wrote all the melody lines. He had all the ideas. Like we joked, like if Bill could sing or if I could sing, we wouldn't need anybody else. And um, <laughs> the relationship has always been great. It's been an amazing mutual respect. We are, we are different kind of people. You know, we have different, um, uh, you know, our personalities are totally different, um, but there's, all, there's never been a lack of respect. There, there's never been a quote falling out. There's just been times where Bill just didn't want to do it, whether it was his physical health that wouldn't enable him to do it. And Bill's not the type of guy to just phone something in. If he can't do it like 110% and be totally mm -hmm. into it, and have that magic because it's really interesting that same magic that we had sitting in that little rehearsal studio you know in 1980 or whatever when it was Bill and I was the same magic that was going on like when we were recording the Holy Empire or we were recording in New York uh, when I lived in New York and Bill came up and we did Rising Out of the Ashes with Joachim it's that same feeling it's like nothing else matters it's 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 heaven it's bliss it's awesome to sit there and record stuff and then hear it come back you know, and just, it just, you're, you're hearing it. It's always an experience, um, a, an amazing experience to record and do those kind of things with Bill. So the, the relationship's been great. It really just comes down to the total uh, dedication and total uh, honoring of the mu music, never doing anything cheap. You know, you, you gotta admit, you know, if you look at that guy, the dude's never written two songs that are even closely related. Think, think about songwriters and guys, I mean, the guy's writing Lucifer's Hammer at 17 years old, sitting on a bus, you know, waiting for a bus. I mean, and I'm not sure if people know this or not, but obviously, you know, Joachim was a big Warlord fan. The, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, you know, they covered Child of the Damned. Yep. You know, or let, let, me, let me rephrase that. They tried to cover Child of the Damned. They didn't do exactly do the drums and guitar justice, but hey, God bless them. God, you know, anytime someone covers your song, hey, that's a compliment. But the whole band name came from Lucifer's Hammer, when the, the line in there is, the hammer will fall on you. You know, the band has an influence, obviously, um, but, you know, it, it's just it's just magic. The guy the guy is genius, never plays a wrong note. I don't think I've ever heard him like play a wrong note. Um, he just has a certain sense, because he's totally into it. Um, it's just, and, and, he, and, he's, and he's got like a God's gift of, that's something that certain people get, you know, that certain people are lucky enough to get. And, and he got it, you know, he, a lot of hard work because obviously, you know, when he was a kid, you know, he had all the lessons and I think it was classical guitar back then. And, you know, he, he put the work in, there was no doubt about it. Uh, and he was never lazy or by any means. And, um, you know, just, just with us, the timing, it's, it's just the timing. and. And he had, you know, physical problems and health problems, and it didn't allow him to do kind of what he wanted to do. Actually, in those days, I was just in a little apartment. I was working at a company that was called National Semiconductor. They were actually, it's kind of like IBM. They yep. were the ones who made the first scanners in the grocery stores. And um, I would work, you know, a normal eight to five, and then me and Bill would rehearse and play. And then on the weekends, we'd play. And... Uh, you know, that was in San Jose. And then when we moved down to LA, um, you know, I was living in a small apartment. Oh, I take that back. No, 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 no. Um, we were living kind of on people's couches for a while. And we had a small rehearsal studio. And then we wound up, you know, getting this warehouse, well, a part of a warehouse. And they used to call it Warlord Manor. And um, <laughs> we had a rehearsal room and we had our little rooms in the corners that just had like sheets up. You know, it wasn't an apartment. It was the, a second story of a, an industrial building, no air conditioning, no shower. We had to make our own shower. We did a whole thing with uh, 
you know, you buy these little kits where you can kind of make your own shower. It, you know, it was, people would say, oh, that's really, you know, that's really rough and, you know, how could you do that? But it was the greatest times, man. We were cranking out Child of the Dam, you know, we we're playing Lucifer's Hammer, Mrs. Victoria. We were, we were just totally engulfed in the band. You know, that's all we were doing. You know, I mean, obviously you had to work I mean, to, to survive, um, you know, by hook or by crook. I mean, I was doing construction with a buddy of mine at the time. You know, I worked for a collection agency. I mean, hey, whatever it took, you know, I mean, obviously we didn't have big expenses, but you know, back then you had to pay for drumsticks, you had to pay for drum heads, you know, you break a cymbal, you're kind of screwed. Um, so yeah, you know, we, we did it the old fashioned band house kind of thing. And, uh, but it was in a warehouse and it was awesome. It was great. You know, I, I wouldn't trade those days for the world. Paris of Troy out the Ludos Records, their debut single, Torn Away. True inside. Australian prog at its best. Available for download and stream on all digital platforms. Torn away.